My name is Stephanie Tran. Now I currently work at the Walt Disney Company, specifically in TV animation. I am an associate producer and I am working currently to develop the projects. One of them, which I unfortunately can't talk about, but I'm very excited about because it is about Asian American kids. And I also, you know, help run studio projects um, in studio overhead for the company. And I'm so excited to be here. I've never really been able to talk about you know, how being Vietnamese American is part of my identity before in this detail with the host who understands also in this detail. So looking forward to it. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over. You know, it's not easy to you know, meet with people that work at Disney to to have a conversation. I've tried it before. There's protocols that we have to go through. So I really appreciate you being here. Of course. Thank you for having me. So before we get into any of the interesting stuff about Disney, you just got back from Vietnam for the first time in your life, correct? Literally just got back last Monday at 11 a.m. And I'm glad that we scheduled this now because I actually am a human again on this side of the uh, equator. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't realize what kind of uh, changes your body goes through as you spend a few weeks in Vietnam and then coming back here. You're like totally destroyed for like a week. Exactly. And when I left too, because I left on June 11th, Sunday, June 11th, we were still in the middle of our June gloom. It was cold, rainy, whatnot. Obviously, we prepared ahead of time and we knew that Vietnam was going to be humid, sunny, hot. And all of us were thinking, this is going to be great. This is going to be so nice. Went there. Obviously, it's a bit of a change, <laughs> a culture shock in terms of how humid it is. Had the best time for three weeks and came back. And obviously this week, you and I both know there's been a huge heat wave in Los Angeles. But when I did land on July 4th, it was still relatively cool. So um, it was like, oh, right, I'm I'm back in Los Angeles, but at least there's sun. <laughs> well, I, I'm interested to hear what you thought of Vietnam before you left. And what was the reality once you got there and spent three weeks there? Sure. So what I thought before I went to Vietnam, because again, as you'd mentioned, I'd never been before. So um, and on top of that, I am the only person in my immediate family who was born in the U.S. So quick history, very quick history about my family. Um, dad's from the north. Um, mom's from the south. They were already married in 1971. Um, obviously, my dad was in the army, um, the South Vietnamese army. Um, they had two kids, my siblings, my sister and my brother. Um, and then after the fall, my dad, like so many of our elders was in a labor camp for a few years. So they weren't able to actually escape Vietnam until 78 and they didn't get to the U S until 79. I was a surprise child. I was the kid that was not supposed to happen. They went to the U S rebuilt their lives very successfully. And I came in the eighties. So with that in mind, I obviously knew the history because I knew it's very easy to see that my parents are not from here, that even my brother and my sister were not born here, even though they came as kids. They're, you know, this is really the only thing they've known for the longest time. So um, when I hear when I heard of it now before I went, it was all a little bit contextual and historical. I think probably in the same way that most kids that um are from here know the Mayflower came in the 1600s. And some of the people that live here still to this day have descendants from the Mayflower. It, it was very contextual. Obviously, my history is a little bit closer to that because that's like, you know, in 50 years, not hundreds of years. But still, it was, I know that I'm the only American. I know that my family are refugees, you know, and whatnot. I knew that it took my parents until 2011 to even decide that they wanted to go back to Vietnam at all. They didn't even want to, understandably so. Um, and I know that for a lot of um, people of that generation, they handle it differently. Some want to go back all the time and some some like certain my aunts and uncles refuse to go back. Um, but they went back first. It was my parents and they went back with some of my aunts and uncles and my cousins in 2011. That was the trip, I think, for them that was the biggest closure trip. 
And I'm glad that happened because I was actually able to go back to Vietnam with my parents and with my older sister and her family. So I knew, and I was honestly a little bit nervous going into this trip because I didn't know what to expect. And I knew I would probably feel, you know, a draw and a calling and I feel, feel like I'm going to this place, but I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, we didn't know how before my parents came in 2011, we didn't know how they were going to react to people who are VQ, but especially people who are VQ that were born here. Like, even though my parents are obviously from Vietnam, my siblings were born in Saigon. It's I'm the one born here. I'm the one that actually in that country sticks out. So um, nervous. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. Um, I I, you real quick. When please. you say no, because I, I kind of like I gravitate to that comment you just made that you kind of stick out. But after the time that you spent there, when you look back, do you yeah. really stick out or do you think that that is something that we think of as an American going back to Vietnam? But the reality is there's thousands of Vietnamese uh, overseas that are in Vietnam and they're not really sticking out anymore because it's such a yep. modern place. Right. So yep. I, can you can you tell me about that? Can Can you address that? Uh, before and after about sticking out because I think that's a, yes. a thing that I really think about quite often as I go back to Vietnam twice a year now and yes. want to hear your thoughts on that. I'm so glad you asked me that question. So um, I definitely think there, so I think it's twofold. I definitely think we are grown up thinking that, oh, you're going to stick out because yeah. you're American. You're, there's no way. Like, I, it, and it's like that first scene, one of the first scenes in Crazy Rich Asians when Rachel is um, shopping with her mother for a dress, right? The lucky red dress to wear when she goes back to Singapore to meet her uh, boyfriend's family. And she's like, I don't understand why they wouldn't like me. I'm Chinese too. And I'm even lactose intolerant. Like what, <laughs> what, what, what would they not like about me? And her mom goes, I mean, you are by heritage, but you grew up here. So there is a little bit of a difference. So you do need to be aware of that. Like just because you are, heritage wise the same there you grew up in a different place so realize that there is a difference there so i do think that is true because i did grow up here there is a difference you know and people did pick up on that but to your point though i totally think it's societal expectation <laughs> that makes a big deal out of it and it's not entirely the truth and you know part of it i think is it's been years now since the war so the majority of it the people that live there they've only heard about it again kind of the same way i did because they were all kids when it was going down or they were born afterwards so when i came back and they realized yeah my my parents were born here my siblings were born here i'm vq this is my first time here i'm so excited to be here and i'm excited to see kind of the homeland every single person i interacted with well welcome back welcome back what do you think your vietnamese is really good um uh, which was both a compliment and slightly insulting that they thought it would be terrible but i also get it because i i wasn't you know i didn't grow up there um what do you like about it so far? Are you excited? To, what are you excited to see? Not in a single moment, even though they knew I wasn't born there and I didn't live there, did I feel like they were leaving me out, that yeah. they didn't want me to be a part of their society? The, the overwhelming majority of Vietnamese people today, I think it's mm -hmm. 70%, were not born during... Exactly. In, exactly. They weren't yeah. born with, within the the the, the 70, 1975. You know, most people um, are young, and yes. even the kids that were growing up, like at maybe three years old, you yeah. know, they weren't aware of anything. And there's so many Vietnamese people in Vietnam, and it's so homogenous that they don't focus on the other. You know, like we focus that we're the other in a society of, of you know white people so yes. Vietnam, they're not thinking about like the war the way we contextualize it and that's the trippiest part about yeah being vietnamese american and i always want to know what people like you who go back for the first time feel about that because then yeah. it just becomes like you're just you're just dropping into the society and everybody's just like they don't think about this at all the way we do no. And to your point, you know, for all of our elders that live here, especially the ones who live in 
Southern California, the ones who, you know, all grew up in Westminster. Not to say that Westminster and Little Saigon haven't evolved. That's not what I'm trying to say. But they came here in a very, very specific point in time. And there are certain aspects that have still lingered from literally 1975 to 1980 or whatever, when the majority of, you know, all of them came here. It's still there. Like the it's like palpably still in the air, whereas the actual country of Vietnam has moved on. (laughs) So it and moved on drastically Drastically. as a country. So um, and again, not to say that all of our elders in Little Saigon are stuck in a time capsule. That's not what I'm trying to say. But it's it's hard not to talk about of why they're there in the first place in Little Saigon in comparison to Vietnam. And the interesting thing is um, a couple of years ago. Actually, before I I went to Disney, this is a total sliding doors moment, but I was working at Warner Brothers um, on a television show and um, I actually over LinkedIn got a request from someone who owned a Vietnamese animation studio in Hanoi. And they obviously were recruiting hardcore from all over the world, um, people with animation experience to come and help them build it. And I actually went a couple rounds with them and I was very interested and I was like, okay, I want to, you know, this is, this is something like, what if I go back to Hanoi, I could live there for a few years and then come back. What do you think? Blah, blah, blah. I talked to my parents about it. They were willing to come with me for a couple months to help me settle in and do whatever. And for no big reason or anything. It was just one of those moments where I realized this isn't the time for this right now. This yeah. isn't the time for this. I had to tell them I'm I'm going to turn you down, but I want you to know this was a really tough decision for me. Like I, I seriously considered this. And two days later, I got the offer from Disney. So it's, it's truly like a sliding doors moment of what could have happened. I made the right choice for, for myself at the time. Um, but I remember during one of the interviews with someone from HR, someone said, actually very similarly to the crazy rich Asians quote of listen you're gonna fit in because you are one of us in the sense of you have the same history and your parents are from here and your siblings are from here but be prepared be prepared that you have spent your entire life in the U.S. by this point there will be a culture shock when you get here because you're Vietnamese American not Vietnamese Vietnamese and I remember at the time I was upset. I was a little upset, not offended, but I was upset of like, what do you mean? I'm not, you know, I'm not part of you. I've already dealt with 30 plus years of trying to figure out what it means for me to be Vietnamese American. It's, you know, what Viet Thanh Nguyen talks about, like living in that dash between yeah. Vietnamese American. And what do you mean? Because exactly. Cause what do you mean? Because like white Americans don't even think I belong here. And and now you're telling me I don't belong there. Like, what, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> um, and weirdly enough, now going there and being there for three weeks and then coming back has actually given me a lot more clarity and peace in living in the dash. Like the beauty of that, mm. of feeling like I do have this calling and I do have a side of me that still misses Vietnam, a country I'd never been before that I wasn't born in, but felt a connection there and loved it there and learned so much about it and learned so much about my parents and you know loved being there and then coming back and being like yes but la is home it it actually gave me a lot more context for that and i mean i don't think i'm gonna be able to get to your point yet where i come back twice a year but i'm like i want to go back i have my five-year you know vq visa when am i going back next and i was able to see all these really great cities but i want to check out sapa next what like how do i get that on the list and there are all these other things i want to go see when i'm in hanoi and when i'm back in saigon and whatnot and i'm i'm already looking forward to going back so um that's uh, again to go back to your question of is it something that we put upon ourselves or is it actually true it's a little bit of both but i definitely think we put it upon ourselves and Obviously, it's an expense and obviously it's a, a, a ways away, but I strongly encourage anybody who, you know, whose parents went through the war, who, you know, a lot of us here are refugees or whatnot, our kids are refugees to, to go back. It's an experience. And obviously, um, uh, there are certainly poor air areas of the country, but poor areas here. Yeah. Wes, you know, um, Obviously, it's a culture shock, but travel's good for everybody. So, 
Well, I'm glad you had, it sounds like a wonderful experience. Now, I want to um, start um, by asking, how did you arrive at Disney? Sure. So um, I probably like you and many Asian American kids was fed for the longest time of like, so you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be an engineer. <laughs> That's well, like the, the tr you know, trifecta basically. Right. And here I was, you know, um, going to high school in Glendora and I'm like, but my favorite my favorite subject's English <laughs> and I, I, and history. And I want to learn more about storytelling and whatnot. And I remember, um, so I went to UCLA. I, when I got there, I telling my parents, Oh, I want to be an English major. And it was like, what are you talking about? What do you, what do you mean? Um, do you want to be a lawyer then? Is that, is that what you want to do? Otherwise you're going to starve. That's, there's no other. And the older I get, the more, understanding and empathy I have for my parents and for immigrant parents for saying that, because when they came here, it was just about survival. Like yeah. they just, we need jobs. We need to make sure that we, you know, our kids can survive. And the way to do that is get a good education. I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, you know, you need to get a good education. You need to get a good job. And that's the way to like be part of America basically. And my dad was able to do that. He was able to get his medical license again. He was a practicing doctor. My brother became a doctor. My brother married a doctor and my sister became an executive working for a pharmaceutical company. So it was also kind of like, this is in your actual DNA of like your, you know, medicine skipped me, but, um, it took them a while to, to understand, like, listen, that's not my thing. <laughs> that's not my thing. Um, and I originally, you know, when I was trying to figure it out, I worked for my school newspaper. And I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to be a, a, a broadcast reporter. I was on camera. I was a broadcast reporter. And um, I was working in the sports department. And I worked I worked my way up uh, the next year to be a news producer. So I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be the next Christian Amanpour, traveling the world, doing stories and, and learning about people and whatnot. Um, when I graduated from college, I promise you this will get you back to Disney. I promise. But when I graduated from college, it was... Do I go to grad school now and actually fully go down this journalism path or what do I do? And like many graduating seniors from college, it was, I do not, <laughs> I cannot fathom more years of school at this moment in time. So my parents told me, great, you have a choice. You know, you can figure it out. You need to get a job. We'll give you the grace of a few months, which is an incredible level of grace that my parents were able and willing to do and were able to afford. I have to give this to them of we'll give you a few months. We'll pay for your rent. You have to figure it out. And then after that, you, you got to go to grad school. Like we, th that cord is going to get cut. Totally uh, understandable and agreeable terms. So great. I have to find a job. And as I was working retail and figuring it out, um, my brother-in-law, who does work in reality TV, said, why don't you just work as an assistant, an executive assistant in reality TV? You know, I can at least help you get that first job, but then you're on your own to figure everything else out. Um, so it was the the most minor level of Nepo baby of I was able to get in the industry, but I know no one famous <laughs> to help me get in there. So that was my first job. I worked in um, reality TV as an assistant. Um, and from there, it's just like every other, um, you know, Hollywood story of I was an assistant for many years, but I worked in reality TV and then I went to a talent agency. I worked at ICM Partners for a while, which is no longer there. It's part of CAA. Um, and while I was there, um, I think one of the strengths that I do have is trying to learn how to adapt to the to the company, figuring out what they need, and then also kind of being a little bit of a sponge and figuring out, you know, what can I learn and how can I help? So from ICM, um, I was helping out on a lot of deals. And at the time I was, I was an assistant working in um, the MP production department. And for people who don't know, if anybody's not coming here, not from the Hollywood um, entertainment system, MP production means that my agent, my boss was repping below the line talent, costume designers, editors, cinematographers, those people that actually helped build the film. Um, at that time, which is 2010 or so when I had graduated from college and, you know, a couple years at that time, 
animation studios were hiring live action DPs, live action cinematographers, in order to help build out the scope of their films. So the perfect example of this is um, Pixar hiring Roger Deakins, who is one of my boss's clients. Roger Deakins, famous cinematographer, did a lot of Coen Brothers movies, one for Blade Runner 2049, the Oscar for that, um, hired him to be a consultant on WALL-E. So when you see WALL-E and you look at all of the big, beautiful space scenes while they're, you know, dancing through space and whatnot, he helped with that. And it was really, you know, figuring out like camera placement, how it, like it should look so expansive when he's there and whatnot. They hired live action DPs to help um, with that. Um, Wally became a huge success and then they were able to hire other cinematographers to help. So those were all my department's clients. So I spent my year there. I was trying to figure out my next steps. And my boss was saying, I think you should actually work at an animation studio. You seem to really, really like it. And it just so happened at that time, the head of legal at DreamWorks Animation said, we need an assistant in our legal department. I don't know if you know of anybody, but our assistant just left. And he was like, great, hire mine. So, um, and he told me, I know you don't want to be a lawyer, but this gets you in the door. Don't think of it as you're stuck in the legal department. Think of it as this is just a step in the door. And then it's all on you to make the connections that you need in order to get to a more creative space. Some of the best advice he ever yeah, gave me. Absolutely. And and I want to comment on that because I've had a few managers and agents on. And, you know, really, when I was uh, coming out of USC, I had friends that told me, go the agent route for a few years. So you can really yeah. understand. It's like the spokes, right? Like you're in the yep. center of the spokes and yep. branches out to the wheel, um, to all of these different departments, especially mm -hmm. when you're at a, a desk as an assistant, you get to see the inner workings on how deals are made and how deals yes. are signed and what gets greenlit and why things happen. And it's so yes. important to kind of be able to understand this ecosystem so you can navigate thoroughly when you're traversing through this universe of, of entertainment. I couldn't agree more. And it's it's basically when you have a check a, a second to check yourself away from the weeds and look up and actually observe. That's what you're you're getting at right there. Where because as an assistant, listen, I get it. I was an assistant for years, and it's boring. And you're doing things like taking notes and doing expense reports and whatnot. And it's easy to be like, well, I just spent thousands of dollars. My parents spent thousands of dollars on a degree, and this is what I'm doing. <laughs> So it's easy to feel that way. But, you know, I encourage any of the younger yeah. people listening to this, keep your head up and just listen. When In your first couple years, when you've graduated from college, obviously you have your day job of making sure your, your boss's life is, is easy. But in order to actually grow, literally all you need to do, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is just to listen. Because even though you don't think about it at the time, those puzzle pieces are getting, putting, getting put together Absolutely. in your brain. And it will help out in the long run. And yes, agency life is tough. It is brutal. not for the faint of heart. It is brutal. I have seen things, especially like pre, you know, Me Too, pre all these, you know, discussions about how assistants are treated at large within Hollywood. They're frankly abused <laughs> for, you know, and I don't say that word lightly, but in terms of workload that they do, in terms of how they're screamed at, it's not healthy. I don't encourage agency life for everybody but if you're willing to do it and if you're willing to put in the time you learn so much and like you just said kenneth the what the levels of connections that you can make not in terms of networking but that also happens too but in terms of connecting all the pieces of the industry is invaluable so that's i think was a big part of me and to i will say it was luck of the draw that i had a boss at that time who was incredibly supportive of me and was like, I get it. You don't want to be an agent. I, I can tell this is not what you want to do, but you can do this. And yeah. I'm going to help you along the way. And when you're ready, he didn't have to say what he said to the head of legal at DreamWorks and say, you should hire my assistant. And here are all the reasons why he did that. I didn't even ask him to. Wow. So um, that's that's how I got into the studio system. And, and you know, and, and learning about, you know, this idea of, of support from your boss and, you know, understanding like the full scope of like why a boss would do that. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's very complicated and complex, but I, I want to break it down for a bit because please. when an agent does that and helps the assistants out, the assistant positions are 
sometimes transition periods in young people's lives. And when an agent recognizes that my assistant doesn't want to be an agent, maybe she should branch out into like the deeper waters of the entertainment industry. That's sort of like the beauty of tough agents and bosses, but they're kind of out looking, they're looking out for your welfare as well, because yes. they know that you yes. are probably going to grow in different ways. And by yes. the time you leave and you're into another place like Disney legal or your, this is, this is very important. It's such a subtle thing, but when people are get leaving desk jobs at agencies and going to other positions, um, the, the ability to be in a new place and then have all that agency experience. When you get dropped into these places, you don't, you, you your brain is not like empty. It's actually yes. the positioning of, of, of building blocks and contextual Absolutely. clues are all there. And so Absolutely. you go into yeah. new positions very confidently to exist mm -hmm. in that and, and build relationships even and, and, and knowledge even, even more fiercely than when you were at the assistant uh, level at the agency. A hundred percent. And it goes both ways. It goes, you know, you have the responsibility, right? When you're the assistant at that time to be open, to listen, to ask for opportunities. And I apparently 23 year old me was a lot smarter than I give myself credit for because I did that. I did that. And I asked questions and obviously I made mistakes, you know, but I w was willing to keep learning. I was willing to learn, uh, you know, the ins and outs or whatnot. But it also was a two-way street that my boss was willing to teach me and he was willing to call me out on my mistakes, but in a way of, let me explain to you what you did incorrectly so that you can learn from this. And he was the one, when I talk, told him, like, I've been on your desk for a year now, what do you think? Like, I'm not, I'm not chomping at the bit right now, but I'm thinking, you know, six months, what do you think? And he was like, yep, you're ready. So we're not in a rush. You and I are fine, but let's talk about having you meet people. Let's talk about what next steps are for you. It, it's a lesson both in making sure when you are in an entry level position to always be learning because I get it. Your day-to-day -day responsibilities are going to be boring as hell when you are starting out, but you're still in learning mode and never lose that. Never lose the learning mode, especially when you're in an entry level position. But it's also a lesson in good management because when you do become a manager at some point and you're leading people, Listen, I've had bad managers too, and I could talk to you for many podcasts about that. But you learn as much from your bad managers as you do your good managers. And that was my first lesson in good managing of we are uh, having a good conversation right now. You are, you know, you're my boss. I am your employee, but we understand each other. And he knew right then and there, it's time for her to go. So how can I help her go? And he and I still talk. It's, it's great. And that's something I learned too, of like, that was good management right there. Yeah, it's um, beautiful. What a beautiful story, you know, and and I think that there's a lot to learn from that because it, it goes really goes both ways. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And he was able then to set me up for success when I went to DreamWorks and he was like, I get it. It's legal, but do it, do it and start networking. You know how to do now because you have the, the foundation of it from working here at mm -hmm. ICM. So I did. And um, just like you said, because I was able to make sure that my eyes were open and I learned um, it obviously was a transition going from agency to a studio system, a lot more politics involved <laughs> going into a studio system. Um, but it was actually a relatively seamless transition. You know, I learned, but I understood one side of how deal making was done. So it actually wasn't that difficult for me to go into being a legal assistant at a studio. It's actually very similar. So, um, but I went in there and I was very open with them of, I don't want to be a lawyer. I don't want to be paralegal. But I am willing to give you 100% of my time here, and I'm willing to give you a year. And they were like, great. You give us a year, we will help you at the end of it. Yeah. You know? And, and how they, long did you end up staying? I ended up staying exactly a year in that and, position. And then and, how did the transition happen from, from yeah. the most legal? Sure. So um, obviously I was, um, I worked on my like day job <laughs> and I made sure everything was done and whatnot, but I kept talking to my bosses who were in charge of, you know, fin finishing all these deals for the studio. And I just started asking questions of like, what are these deals for? And are these producers in house? Can I meet with a recruiter for production just to ask them? Obviously I'm not going to leave your department anytime soon, but can you make the intro? Sure. And, and it was, 
you know, you can't do that right away, but I worked for them for, you know, we'll say six months at that time, right? We already had established a level of trust by then. And they knew Steph's good for it. She's good for it. She's going to do a good job. She's going to continue. She's starting to ask questions now of how we run at a studio. And she's curious. And we know she's not going to stay for a little bit more than six months, you know, moving forward. Why not? So they started putting me in contact with people. Um, and I started meeting people and saying, this is what I've been doing. And I know that I've been working in um, in a legal department. I was working at an agency, but I'm actually interested in production. I'm actually interested in learning more about that or learning more about creative. Um, how do I get there? So uh, we kept talking and I was very honest about to my bosses about this. They were not in any way, shape or form in the dark <laughs> that this was happening. Um, and it just so happened. And this right here is an example of just good timing, pure good timing um, at the, on my part. But when I was there at DreamWorks was in 2012 and 2013 at that time. And at that time, DreamWorks Animation was building up their television department. So they had hired consultants. They'd hired away, you know, former heads of production and heads of studio at Nickelodeon to help them build in an, in an animation studio for TV. And we were working with them because they were the people that we needed to work with as a legal department to sign contracts. And we had some, you know, uh, TV shows in place and they were, you know, still talking to them and whatnot. It was just organic, right? And because I was the assistant, I happened to be the runner to all of these executives to sign contracts or to review contracts to look at. Um, I'm having all these meetings. I want to get into production. What are my next steps? And again, this was pure, just good timing. Um, the consultant, oh, there's my cat. Uh, the consultant for uh, DreamWorks at the time happened to be telling one of my bosses, hey, so I actually just got hired full time now. I'm going to be the head of physical production for DreamWorks Animation TV. I need an assistant because my one at Nickelodeon is going to stay at Nickelodeon. I've been gone for too long. Um, I, I'm just going to, you know, ask HR to, and, and recruiting to look for one for me. And again, have to hand it to my bosses. They were like, nope, look no further. I'm putting you up, like, get, get my assistant in the room. You're meeting her. Let's have some informal interviews wow. and let's see what happens. Again, did not have to do that. Truly did not have to do that. And I met him and that was my first production job. I was the head of productions assistant at DreamWorks TV. Um, that's and a big, That's a big role. It's a, it was big. It was big. Yeah. And at that time, I wasn't just the executive assistant to the head of production, which is already big, um, which is also why I'm always kind to the current head of production at Disney TV's assistant, because I was him at one point in time. But it was crazy when I, I started on that job in 2013 because they didn't have a TV studio. It didn't exist. Wow. So we obviously weren't a startup because we were part of DreamWorks and that's a big corporation. Yeah. But we were kind of startup adjacent yeah. because we had a new building that was being built for us. I We didn't have a facilities department. I was the one getting supplies from Office Depot at a certain point. I was the one, because we didn't have an HR person yet, onboarding people with feature HR because they didn't have anyone yet. That was my first job. I was like, this is truly not a joke. I was one of the first 10 people that worked there at DreamWorks TV. So honestly, truly got to see it built from the ground up. So um, even though I left in 2016 and I, I, I went from, uh, you know, assistant position into being a production coordinator, and then I left in 2016, have still like a soft spot in my heart for DreamWorks because I was there from the very beginning at DreamWorks TV. And I was honestly lucky enough to help it build from the ground up. Um, so yeah, then I became a production coordinator. I left um, DreamWorks and I went to Warner Brothers. Um, and then from Warner Brothers, I went to Disney, um, but I worked at Disney Toon Studios. This is in 2017. Um, that was my first manager role. Um, and I've been at Disney ever since, but I haven't always been at TVA. I've had to jump around a little bit, mainly because Disney Toon Studios um, got shut down in 2018. So I was out of a job. And I needed to take anything. And um, again, 
um, one of my former friends who worked at Disney Toon Studios, which, by the way, for anybody that doesn't know, was the animation division at Disney that was the original direct-to-consumer. So before Disney Plus existed, but you've all heard about it, like the Cinderella 2 and, you know, Emperor's New Group before it became an actual feature animation, were all done at Disney Toon Studios. So all the spinoffs that you've seen and heard of, that was Disney Toon Studios. Well, why did we it go out of business? Or why did they shut it down? Um, I can only speculate. Since I was just a manager at the time, I wasn't running the studio or whatnot. But I think it was just... I don't, you know, a lot of things were happening at that time. This was post Me Too. And obviously John Lasseter was um, someone that was rightfully called out for, you know, um, bad behavior at that time. John Lasseter was uh, the head of all of the animation studios at that point at Disney. Um, and it was, but Disney Toon Studios was a little bit of his pet project because we were working on um, offshoots of Cars, which is one of his favorite properties. So um, it was, wait a second. So we're not moving forward with planes and trains and blah, blah, blah. What do we do then? Um, Disney Plus was just starting in 2017, 2018. So I think it was just, they made, you know, whoever they is just made a decision of, we don't need that. We don't need that segment. We don't need that studio. Um, it was a bummer. It was a bummer. Um, but that's crazy. Cause um, it, I mean, I'm just, speculating i mean it sounds like they shut the whole thing down because if we can't sign deals because of john lasseter we just have to put this division down i mean i can't speculate but i'm sure it was a factor um and i'm sure there were other economical factors too i also think it, I, in this case i also think it wouldn't be fair to put the blame all on john lasseter yeah. um i think he was just one contributing factor got it and he's a god yeah. over in the animation world absolutely out. absolutely even now even now with oh, you know god, all yeah. of the stuff coming to light about how he's just you know slightly um not great <laughs> in certain ways um but uh, exactly. That's a big thing that Disney did, you know, um, and I, I do think, however, streaming played a role of what do we do now with this direct to consumer division? Because now we want to get into streaming and we have already a TV studio and a feature studio, two feature studios. We have Pixar and Disney Animation. Do we really need them? And, you know, we can argue all day on maybe you should have kept us because you need more now to funnel into <laughs> Disney Plus. But again, I don't make those decisions. And I also don't think Disney made those decisions lightly. So I can speculate because I worked there and obviously I was annoyed at the time, but they're looking at many factors. Yeah. They decided to shut it down. So you leave uh, Disney Toon and now you're kind of like floating in the ether and you're trying to figure yeah. out the next step. What happens? So um, I was unemployed for a couple months. And again, I was lucky, especially for so many of our current brethren after the WGA strike and the SAG strike now who aren't working. Mm -hmm. I was I, and who haven't been working for months. Um, I, I got lucky. I was really only unemployed for about three months. Um, and during that time, I was interviewing all around town. And obviously, all the executives at Disney Toon Studio were everywhere. The majority of them left to go to TV animation, though, Disney TV. And um, I obviously was still talking to some of them. But it just, timing is everything. And it, there were just no really open positions that they could see me in because it was, okay, well, we need to give you at least a production manager role. And there aren't any right now. So let's just wait and figure it out. And I was talking to um, the former head of recruiting for Disney Toon Studios, who then left to go to Disney Animation Studios, the feature um, studio. And he was like, listen, why don't you just take like a like an independent contractor gig around Disney? I have a few that I can send your way. I'll put in a good word for you. Just interview with them. I know it won't be in animation. I know it won't be in production, but it keeps you in the Disney system. We can still talk to you and give you, you know, um, any kernels that we have of upcoming jobs but i think you just right now need to focus on getting a job and getting into the system again and working your way around and making more connections and then we can keep talking basically in all honesty very similarly to my old boss at icm's advice of i get it not what you want to do but think big picture right now like i know it sucks but think big picture so i did i took a leap of faith and um, it just so happened there was an, uh, a consultant independent contractor gig um, 
in live action employee relations <laughs> HR at the Walt Disney Studios. And they needed a production consultant because they were looking at building systems to work better with all of the live action productions for the Walt Disney Company. And I'm talking Disney, Marvel, Lucasfilm, and eventually Fox, because they did acquire Fox during that time, of how do we track how we're tracking all the employees you know, and the day players for all of these big budget movies. We need a way to track them to make sure that they, A, are taking their training, B, are not lost in the system somewhere, and C, we know and we now have data on them so that if something goes wrong and they put forward an HR complaint, we now know who these people are. Um, and I was like, oh, you need help with like figuring out systems? I can do that. <laughs> that's that's what I do. Can't help you with HR. Can't help you with live action. But I can 100% help you make your lives easier putting together systems and production tracking. So that's what I did for a year. And again, they knew. They were like, we know the second you get a, a job back in your normal life, you're going to leave us. But thank you for putting in your 100%. Thank you for, you know, helping us out with this. And we'll just keep talking about that. And um, so I did. And I was able to make connections then at all these various studios and, um, you know, talk to um, all of their producers about how to help out with these set tracking systems. The entire time, still meeting with all my old friends who are now at all other studios, still talking to my old bosses who are now at TV animation. And finally, um, uh, in 20, was it 2019? 2019. Finally in 2019, got a frantic call basically from um, now my um, my head of the studio at TVA, who I still talk talked to, and was like, we have a production manager gig. It's in development. We, you need to apply for it immediately. I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to apply for it. And at this point, I had been in my, you know, consultant gig for about 10 months. So a good amount of time. And I told them, like, listen, I got this interview. I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm, you know, I, I have to do it. It's with my old my old bosses. It's an animation production again, which is what I care about. Um, I'm going to do it. And they were like, do it, do it. We we knew you were never going to stay long term. Do it. I was like, great. So um, worked out, got that job, worked in, and then that's where I, when I came to Disney TVA, uh, was a production manager in development, then got promoted to associate producer in development, and then transferred from development now into my kind of more studio overhead role. Um, and that's my journey of when I got to, to Disney and I've seen it all. I've saw, I saw the layoffs. I saw, uh, this is my third CEO <laughs> that I've seen, technically second, but third CEO um, since Iger came back. Um, I've seen Disney loves to consolidate and then expand and consolidate. They're very big on acronyms. Um, so um, yeah, and it, listen, you and I both know this, no studio is perfect, but you know, Disney's been a trip. It's been fun. I'm happy. Now, what what is... What is your day to day now with um, in terms of like your job? Like, what do you do in your uh, your job description? Sure. So um, my job is twofold. And like every other person, I'm sure that you've interviewed who works in entertainment, it's like no day is the same. But I can at least, you know, talk about it in two spheres of influence, basically. So the first thing that I do is I am still attached to something that I've been working on and developing since I was in development and um, working to get it, you know, hopefully greenlit and moving forward and whatnot. Again, can't really say anything about it because it hasn't been announced yet, um, but I'm very excited about that and I will be, you know, helping to produce it when the time comes. But that's only one part of my day to day is getting this, you know, project up and running, hopefully. The other aspect of what I do is um, basically help out on studio-wide projects that need to get done. So for example, we have all the producers, right? And there are producers that work specifically on projects. So every single show that's currently on Disney TVA, Haley's on it.
just I can imagine at one point in the 50s and 60s, you know, at Disney was all in-house. It was all like in 100%. Burbank. Yep. And now I am sure all of this is getting farmed out from, you know, the the bottom, the lowest positions at Disney's uh, mm-hmm. animators all the way up to maybe the mid-level mm-hmm. executives now are all being farmed out to different countries. So yep. how is that change? You know, I can imagine the AI stuff is moving so quickly and rapidly. What is that like for you? Oh, my goodness. I feel like not a single day goes by without an artist talking to me about how much they hate AI and, and explaining to me in incredible detail, actually, um, and, and teaching me more about how AI is a problem. So to your point, you're absolutely right. The days of everybody is in-house from the in-betweener to the animator to the post person, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's very few and far between. You know, like Pixar usually has everybody in house. Basically, if you work in feature, Pixar, Disney Animation, DreamWorks, if you're in feature, a lot of them are in-house. That is not the the regular business model. If you work in television, you have pre-production here, you have your crews here, your designers here, storyboard artists, and then all the animation goes overseas. We all have vendor studios, and then it comes back for post. But we now have third party productions where we just hire a studio and we only, you know, oversee at the highest level. Um, Kith is a good example of that, where it's we hired Titmouse to produce it for us. And we then only have, you know, a creative executive overseeing notes, a production executive overseeing uh, the project to make sure it's running smoothly and on time and on budget. Um that's another thing that's happening. So it's already been in place in animation. We're very used to working with overseas studios and third-party studios. It's it's very normal. And even in features, they'll have, you know, one movie in-house, but they'll work with a third-party uh, vendor studio for another. So it's, it's becoming the norm. AI is a more existential threat, though, because, and, and it's in, at, what actually started out even before AI, um, is hearing all of the very, very passionate debates from artists and from my friends about how things like um, NFTs have ruined things for artists because there is no check and no approval process of that art that you are selling for however much money was actually stolen by somebody else. There's already been an issue online, even before all this of like, you know, you can copy and paste something on Google and put it on DeviantArt and pretend it's yours kind of thing. So um, not great, obviously, but, you know, that's a little bit easier. But now we're dealing with NFTs where that happens. And that actually has happened to artists I know where they go online and they're like, what? That's my art and you're selling it. And you didn't even tell me that this is happening. So now triple that with AI where they can compile hundreds upon hundreds of designs from various artists make a compilation of it and come up with something else and the artists are getting zero credit for it not even money which is already a problem they're not even getting credit for it and and that's the big and and listen i'm only saying all of this as an outside observer i i'm in those meetings so i know studio executives have other concerns as well so I'm 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 not trying to say any of this in like the writers and the, the actors striking are 100% right or the studio is 100% right. I don't know. I'm not in those, you know, negotiations. I'm only speaking as as a completely outside person on this. But that being said, AI is an existential threat. And, you know, there are certain ways where the studio wants to think about AI in the sense of can we make our production's lives easier in not having to worry about these things to the artists saying, yeah, but you can't do that without giving us credit and paying us and you're going to get us out of jobs. So it's, it's hard. It's really, really hard. And quite frankly, that's why I'm not surprised the WGA and SAG are on strike because it's something that we need to talk about. We are living in such a complex world that just does not seem to get easier. No. Doesn't doesn't seem to get easier because there's not only just, 
this idea of the studios and sort of the profit margins that they're made. But we're talking about other things that are much more insidious, that, that are much more mm -hmm. dark, like AI and you know the mm -hmm. nebulous nature of uh, compensation and and taking and and what is what 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 can we consider uh, copyright when it's yes. a machine that's doing all this stuff? It is a, a crazy and scary landscape for for artists and and people in the creative uh, work mm -hmm. next few years. It is, and I. As, as much as I hate knowing that that the especially for live action, um, that I hate the fact that the industry has shut down, especially after the pandemic, where it was already bad to begin with, yeah. it, it kind of makes sense to me, you know, and it, it makes sense to me that we need to have these conversations now. And I, I'm not surprised that it got to an inflection point where, you know, artists are understandably annoyed and they want to talk about it and they they should and you know studios can be a little bit more transparent of like why they want to consider it and whatnot and listen i'm not in those rooms i i, I am not paid 27 million dollars like bob Iger to, to make these decisions so um i'm sure they've talked about it in some ways how it can help the studios i'm sure there are some valid reasons for that but, you know, just like every negotiation, it's it's going to have to take everybody to come to the table. And I'm not sure the studios are ready to do that yet. So, yeah, so we'll see. So my last question is, what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? Oh, my gosh. So many things. Um, I think. And, and my answer to this question has evolved over time. Because um, obviously I grew up in, in L.A. County, which is a lot more diverse than many other you know people. Um, but I grew up in a very, very white neighborhood. Um, so being Vietnamese to me when I was a kid meant I was just different and I didn't like it. Um, and I just wanted to fit in. And I didn't know why I didn't fit in. Um, even though in certain ways I did fit in. I fit in, you know, socioeconomically, I fit in education wise, um, but I didn't look like everybody else. I didn't look like all of my friends. Um, when I was in college, being Vietnamese meant that I was starting to kind of learn more about my identity a little bit. Um, but I didn't want to talk about, you know, being Vietnamese, about being Asian. Um, I didn't join the Vietnamese Student Union <laughs> on campus. I didn't even join any of the Asian, you know, American unions on campus. I didn't want to be associated with it. It went from I don't want to be different to I just don't want to be associated. I, I'm i curious. I've gone away from feeling different to I'm curious, but I don't want to talk about it. This is personal. This is my my own thing. And that's it. When I became a young adult, it was, wait, why do I feel this way? Why do I feel this shame? It, it became actually more self-reflective in my 20s of why do I feel this way? I shouldn't be feeling shame, but I don't know how to feel pride right now. And I've never actually felt that before. What what does that look like? Definitely a lot more self-reflection. Um, now in my, in my early to mid 30s, it has actually morphed into pride. And it's morphed into not even just I'm proud of myself, I'm proud of my family, but like, what are all the millions of ways I can talk about being Asian American and Vietnamese that I will literally batter you down <laughs> with it? I, if you told me what uh, 10 years ago when I was 24, that Steph, you're going to go to Disney and you're going to start an affinity group at your studio for Asian Americans, I'd be like, you're insane. There's no way I'm going to co-found that. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to talk about Asian American issues all the time at work. And I'm going to be on podcasts where I get to talk about this. You're, you're insane. You're making it up. But that's exactly what happened. <laughs> I, I did do that. And I'm really passionate about it. And I work with the other affinity groups at Disney to talk about this. Um, not only just Asian American ones, but, you know, LGBT ones, black ones, just, just to talk about how identity is so important. So um, and I went to Vietnam with my family and I'm honestly still processing it now of all of the things I've learned about myself, about my parents, about my heritage it it is uh, 100% morphed into pride 
And I think part of that too is Vietnamese people are so resilient. They've had to be for so many reasons. And um, we've been colonized since the dawn of our history from multiple, you know, other countries. We've still survived it for better or for worse in, um, you know, how the current country is. And depending on if you talk to my parents about what about that. But we're resilient. We've been able to keep fighting. And the Vietnamese Americans here who knew nothing, left with nothing, didn't matter what you had back in the old country, right? You got nothing when you come here. You were able to survive to the point where your Viet Q kids like me can go through her own self-reflection journey to also get to the point of pride. That's incredible. So for, for me, being Vietnamese means being resilient being um, self-reflective, but just in all honesty, just being proud, being proud of it. And to go back to Viet Thanh Nguyen, one of my favorite authors, it's to living within that dash, the dash between Vietnamese American and being cool with it. I never thought I'd say that, but being cool with it, I'm like, no, no, I'm Vietnamese American. I'm both. And that's really fucking cool. Yeah, very cool. You know, I um, was going through um, some emails this morning to find um, your bio and stuff like that that you sent. And I noticed that uh, back in February, early February, we had established contact through Ashley Windewitt. Uh, shout yes. out to Ashley. Our good shout out to Ashley. Um, and so, yeah, she had, you know, told me, hey, you should send the invite for the dead party out to you. And and the beauty of like the journey of all of this is like, you know, we're probably six months away, uh, a few months out from that February. And I and I look back on like sort of like this email that went out to you to invite you. And we like we don't know each other. Right. Like we don't there's no concept of like this person who exists in Disney for the last, you know, or has been in the entertainment industry for like the last 10, 15 years. And mm -hmm. today having this really in-depth, meaningful conversation about the journey from like, really from the beginning all the way to where you are today, it, it just makes it for me so surreal. And um, I really want to say thank you for for being you and for going through your journey and for agreeing to, to share this story with me on the podcast. Thank you, Kenneth. I, and honestly, I do want to also thank you again for inviting me to that, uh, that party back in February, but also in all honesty for inviting me to this community. I had no idea there was a whole community of Vietnamese Americans working in entertainment that day on that night on Friday, when we froze our asses off <laughs> in in Brittany Tran's backyard, also shout out to Brittany, in Brittany's backyard was revelatory for me. And I know I'm a little bit late to the party in terms of feeling that sense of pride. and like, where are my, where are my other Viet, Viet Americans at? Where are my other VQs at in LA? Let's all hang out all the time and do all these things outside of my family. I'm so happy. You like, I, we, we talked about how I went to Vietnam and I felt immediately welcomed. I felt immediately welcomed when I was there and it immediately, it led me to be like, how do I help this community more? How do I talk about it more? How do we work together and have yeah, more projects absolutely. about us? You know, um, well, I'm looking forward to that. Well, I just want to, I, this is the first time I'm talking about this upcoming event right here. Um, September 16th. I mean, it's a, it's not a general invite. Uh, we, we're not inviting the, the public. I, I can talk about it because it's important to, talk about the Vietnamese Film Festival uh, here in Orange County. Um, uh -huh. I am uh, aligning with VALA, which is the Vietnamese Americans Arts and Letters Association. So it's VALA and the Vietnamese Podcast. We mm -hmm. are organizing a Tất Chung Tu party like the one in, in February, but okay. maybe triple the size. Oh my God. Okay. So it's triple the size of, of what I did in February. Um, because we want to bring awareness to the Viet Film Festival in October. So uh -huh. in, in September, we are inviting all the industry folks like you from L.A. to come down to Orange County. And then we have like our guest list from Paris by Night and all the entertainers in Orange County. And then we have the socialites from South County, like Laguna, Newport, yeah. uh, Hermosa Beach, South Bay. So we're putting like three different worlds together. So we can amplify and and really be the focal point of where uh, Vietnamese Americans in the entertain, entertainment industry is heading. So chefs, uh, music, mu music people, film people, all mm -hmm. entertaining, creative people in um, SoCal. 
and we're at, we are inviting people from the East Coast and stuff like that to all fly in to be a part of this Legend Two party. So it's huh? like a, a bigger version of what I did in in February, and you will be invited as well, and Ashley, and mm-hmm. we'll be sending all that out. So that this is the first time I've talked about it uh, live because now things are actually you've been working on. I've been working on it for a few months now, a few weeks now. So it's now uh, actually coming into reality. I'm so excited. I, I'm already like, count me in. I'm there. I, I'm there. And by the way, just really quickly to backtrack, <laughs> you know, you're Vietnamese. Like, tell me you're Vietnamese without telling me you're Vietnamese by it's having somebody mention Paris by night, at least once in, in a conversation. The fact that you just so casually said that was amazing. <laughs> like, yeah, Paris by night. We all know what that is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Gauki Ying was at the first party. Uh, well, it, in the February party, that was actually the second party. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll be having all of these uh, superstars show up to the party. Oh, I love that. I love that. I'm I honestly I'm I'm genuinely so happy to be part of this community now. You're never going to get rid of me now, <laughs> Kenneth. And, um, you know, when all us Viets get together, the food's going to be lit. So <laughs> well, we're, you, happy, you t- we're happy to have you part of our community and we are honored to have so much great talent and diversity within the Vietnamese community here in LA. And, you know, we're discovering that these pockets are happening in Orange County. They're happening all over the world. And so we are, this is what we're here for. We're here to, to, to really align all of our sort of our, 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 our strengths and, and bring it to representation in, in, in the world. Absolutely. I'm I'm honestly happy to help out in any way, shape or form. So you just let me know, Kenneth. I'm there. Thanks, Stephanie. Well, have a great weekend and we will talk very soon. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast.